All right, everybody. So today, back on the podcast, we have Abel Chabayi. How you doing, man? Hey, Dave. I'm good. I'm good. How are you doing? Doing well. So uh, obviously, you know, you know, we're always just kind of talking in the group chats and whatnot, and I feel like it's just a number of topics come up. So we were talking a little bit about, well, actually, I made a post, let's see, probably two, three days ago on my experience at the uh, chiropractors. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that and like general back pain and things like that. So have you ever been to a chiropractor before, Abel? Uh, no, I, I've, I've very strongly considered it at one point when I had some mysterious uh, shoulder issue, which just didn't want to go away. And uh, actually, Berge Fagerli, he, uh, he swore by those. Uh, so he recommended, what was the name of that? Uh, AR, ART? ART, yep. Yeah, ART, he recommended that. That was not available in my area. And then he recommended, um, what's the, it starts with an N, Nafta, how, how are you pronouncing that? Naftaroth, something like that. I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah, but so it's similar to a chiropractor, um, chiropractor from what I'm understanding. And then, yeah, I even considered, uh, yeah, like, like everything by the end of it. But then I spoke with some sports doctor who, like basically roasted me in his office for even <laughs> considering it. And then I feel, felt so ashamed that I even thought of such um, woo-woo things that I <laughs> yeah, decided not to. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, going back, uh, you know, when I was in sixth grade, I actually threw my back out. So I was playing basketball and I bent down to pick it up. And I just, I could barely move. I was like, what the heck just happened? And mm. I remember seeing a chiropractor, and saying, oh, I had like the worst back he's ever seen and all this, whatever. So um, I had gone to him for a little bit when I was young, not, you know, not really knowing anything. And then as I, I've learned more and more, I mean, it, it's interesting. So physical therapists and chiropractors often have very opposing views. And it really seems like chiropractic is just, there's just not a lot of evidence um, for it. And, and actually plenty of evidence against you know, some of the practices they do. I mean, I just posted on my story about there have been instances of people having strokes and, and like just a lot of issues after these neck adjustments. Now, I'm not trying to say that that's common. I mean, obviously, thousands of people are, are getting their necks cracked every day by chiropractors. It's a very rare event. Um, and there's also plenty of issues that happen in medicine and whatnot, but it's more just the lack of evidence. So, um, mm -hmm. so I had a good chiropractor in uh, when I was in dental school. And I went to him for ART. So for people who don't know active release technique, it's kind of like a deeper tissue method. Um, Graston is another one that's out there. And I, I've seen some things suggesting evidence, but I actually, I first heard about it back on the uh, bodybuilding forums where people would talk about how ART was so amazing. And uh, Ken Skip Hill from Intense Muscle was talking about how his chiropractor saved him and all these things. So um, you know, whether or not they did and how much was placebo, I'm not sure, but, uh, I, I, this guy really did seem to help. And all I could say is that I was having a lot of pec and shoulder issues and, and basically couldn't bench. And within about five set, I mean, for a while, you know, and then within five sessions I was benching. So mm. whatever you want to call it, you know, even if you could say it was placebo somehow it's, it helped. Right. So it was yeah. what it was. Um, but this guy, so I, I go to this guy and I'm just like, you know, without saying his name or anything. I'm like, well, you know, I'm, I'm open to it. Let's see. And I, and I get in there and he immediately is saying, well, you know what? Like, you're, we're not going to have you do anything at home. You know, it's all, it's going to be here. And, you know, I'm going to have, I'm going to have you taken care of and I can work some magic. And, you know, which is generally just not what I, I think should be practiced. You know, I, I think the reality is most of the chronic pain issues we have are not going to be fixed in single sessions here and there, right? They're built up over time and habits yeah. and, and whatnot, right? So um, I get there and <laughs> he starts talking about how he's going to do an ultrasound on my back, like for treatment, not like an ultrasound to test something, but like he's going to have this done and he's going to do, um, what was it called? Lymphatic drainage. And he put the suction cups yeah. for cupping and all this stuff. And I'm just like, okay. But the worst of it was he had these high school techs who he just left the room and said, okay, do this, do this, do this. And then they're there in front of me asking like, so wait, was it this or this? Should I do this? And I'm like, oh, I mean, God. this is the guy who works with like some top athletes and whatnot. So um, needless to say, it, it was not the best first impression of 
or I guess, <laughs> you know, first impression in a while of going back to a chiropractor and I, I can't see myself doing it again. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I mean, yeah, that that's pretty messed up, but I, I think there, there must be something to it in some cases, because I'm sure you've had these back issues or just like, not necessarily like a full blown injury or something crippling, but something that just really bugs you for a while where you had the feeling that man, like if something could just be like cracked back into place or something like that, like I've, I've had this with my hip now, like a week ago or so now it kind of seems like it went away. But it just felt like, man, like something is like freaking out of place. It's almost like, you know, when you just like crack your back, like you just do this stretching motion, like kind of you twist your torso into different directions and it just makes this very satisfying popping feeling mm -hmm. or, and, and popping sound. So it's kind of like that, but you feel like something more profound is needed. But But at the same time, you can tell that it's not like some serious injury, just something is somehow not aligned properly and if yeah if someone could just crack me back to the right place so to speak i i, I frequently have that feeling um so i i guess there must be something to it in some cases yeah i, I don't know if i think there's something to it for that reason i mean that could just be the feeling that you know i mean we've kind of had oh like you just feel like you need to crack your knuckles or something i don't know if that's helping anything long term um, I, I think the good chiropractors I've seen tend to lean a little bit more towards physical therapy. They'll say, you know, you want to adjust this stuff at home or you want to make sure you're doing these things. Like I was very surprised to hear this guy say that, you know, he was basically, and again, I'm not trying to hate on him or anything, but he, you know, he was clearly doing things that ha could easily get reimbursed by insurance. He actually even specifically said he does not do ART or grass and despite liking them because there's not much insurance reimbursement for them. So basically it's like, Hey, I'm just going to, you know, do, but he can certainly have these high schoolers do these things and get reimbursed. Right. So mm -hmm. I think that's obviously a problem, but then also I, I just think it's, it's very hard to um, undo, you know, weeks or months or whatever of, of issues by just saying, I'm going to come in and do this session versus I'm going to look, I'm going to work at, on stuff at home. Um, but th those who I think have been good, I think there's still a little bit of that woo woo stuff in, in most cases. But I think that they also, again, the ones I've seen have taken stuff more from physical therapy and, and medicine and tried to implement it as well. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, not surprisingly, a lot of these, you'll see some of these chiropractors go down this like a uh, holistic functional medicine route. And I'm all about taking a, a, an overall like holistic approach. So I'm not trying to hate on that. Um, I'm definitely not somebody who just says, you know, prescribe drugs and that's it. I'm more just saying that there has to be evidence behind it. And I just think it's uh, oftentimes not there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like on the whole chronically chronic issues topic, like I was actually considering now doing um, like an MRI or something like I don't have an injury now or anything, but if, if I could get some, because sometimes I see these ads on, on Instagram and whatever, like local stuff, like some blood test that you can do for relatively cheap or some tests that you can do for relatively cheap. And I was considering doing an MRI to check out my back just to see like, okay, so like now seemingly injury free, what would they see? Like how many herniated discs I have or whatever? Because I, I wondered so many times, like, I don't know how much you've seen of Mano's injury um, recently. Like, he had some back problem that was pretty significant. No, I haven't seen it. Yeah. And it was, like, just some completely random thing that um, that made it worse. So, he was doing bench press, like, dumbbell bench presses, I think. And as he was arching, all of a sudden, he felt a pop in his back. Mm. And then he went and had an MRI and like multiple herniations in his spine and whatever that they saw. And so you, ha you, you have to think that this was not a recent thing. Like this has been coming for a while. So I was just thinking like, okay, like now like seemingly healthy, what would they see? Cause I, I would not be shocked at all if <laughs> I had like some really messed up thing in my back from the deadlifting. Like you've seen some of the the thing I sent you guys yesterday, for example, with the round back deadlift thingy for the erectors, like if these things are gradually destroying my back, I would not be surprised. So 
Hmm. Yeah, I guess that's another thing we can discuss is when I was young and, you know, just thinking I, I was, I knew everything, but not even, it's not that I thought I knew everything. I think it's that you're listening to other people that are supposed experts, right? And and that's where the problem yep. comes in is, is ultimately you have to learn a lot of the stuff for yourself, but you know, even, even if you go to medicine, right. And you actually go to med school and you listen to these professors, a lot of times it's like, Oh, well, I learned this here. And it's like, okay, you've, you know, it doesn't make sense that everything you learn, you're then going to stop and then go look up the research papers that were the foundation of that knowledge, right? Of course you can't do that, but there are certainly instances where it's like, okay, but where did we get this information? So I can think of one example where um, a doctor, I know her dad was a physician who was really against antibiotics, right? Mm -hmm. And not like all uses of them, but just generally he, he didn't like them much. And why was that? Well, his wife was prescribed antibiotics and had all these side effects and, and went down a whole issue with that. Yet mm -hmm. that was one anecdote that then made him not like it. And then he probably went down the whole rabbit hole of the evidence that's out there against antibiotics and blah, blah, blah. But he still had the same like, you know, med school, um, education and everything else. But it was that one instance that then led him to ultimately have this strong bias against it. And now you could turn to him as a source of information of somebody, oh, antibiotics are a problem. Conversely, everything else in this guy's life could have been exactly the same, but his wife could have had some horrible infection and then antibiotics cured him or cured her. And this same guy with the same education, everything else would have had that anecdote and then gone down the rabbit hole of, hating on people who were against antibiotics and, and he was such a fan of antibiotics and there's the, the best development ever. Right. And all that to say mm -hmm. that even those who are highly educated and, and try to keep our bias out of it, we have our biases and we have our, um, you know, instances and in our personal anecdotes that highly color what we believe. And so, you know, when yeah. you're young and you're getting into this, you could very, very easily find intelligent, otherwise, um, rational people who could tell you that steroids aren't that big of a deal or power yeah. lifters who have been doing this for 30 years who tell you, ah, you know, there's no problem with deadlifting or there's no problem with heavy squats and it's fine. And, and, you know, these could be guys like Dave Tate and Dan green and on whatever. And, and like these, you know, really big names. And so if you're a 16 year old, you're just like, yeah, okay, see, there's no problem with it. And then as you get older, I'm not trying to say deadlifts are a problem to be clear. I'm not saying that I'm just saying, I don't think it's as, straightforward as 17 year old me thought which was oh deadlifts are totally fine there's no risk of uh, anything and as, as long as you have good form you're fine because the reality is pretty much every power lifter who's been doing this for a long time is beat up and has chronic injuries almost all of them and i think the reality is that once you start getting into you know the four or five six hundred pound territory for deadlifts you things can happen even if you're keeping things really tight so a little bit of a rant there, but just to say, I do think that it makes sense that a lot of people who are purely into bodybuilding switch away from these movements because you just don't see a ton of bicep tears with controlled chest supported rows, right? You don't yeah. see a ton of pec tears with controlled hammer strength incline presses, right? But you see it all the time with mixed grip deadlifts and bench presses and things like that. So um, just a little rant there. I'll, I'll kind of get back into um, the pain thing, but I don't know if you have any comments there. Yeah, just what that reminded me of is um, like, so this is one thing that I'm actually grateful for these communities on the internet, like um, like more plates, more dates. Like I have a lot of issues with that channel, but it's great, for example, that on the hair loss topic, like he went so all in. And he has tons of resources there. And actually, you can learn quite a bit. And I would say that if I want to find um, like a resource which has a pretty balanced view on whether you should use finasteride, for example, like his channel is one of the best out there. Who is this again? Uh, Derek from... Oh, from oh, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. like I remember as a, like a 19-year-old kid, um, like being like freaking out that oh my god i'm losing hair and like i i was like paralyzed like not knowing whether i should use finasteride or or not because i read this book from a guy who had like some he was not a doctor but he had some some background which made him credible 
And he was like, yeah, yeah, like it's, it's no problem. Like, uh, like use it is great. Um, and I even like exchanged some emails with him then. And he was like very, very confident that it's fine. But then, you know, he was using it. He has been using it for like 20 years by that point, And he had no issues. And then you run into these forums on the internet where everybody's freaking out about it. And it's like, okay, so, so what do I do? And you have like <laughs> no way to tell because everybody feeling, everybody feels very strongly about their own anecdote. Right. And then, and yeah, so it, it's great that at least we have resources now, uh, like, like Derek in this case. So I guess that exists probably in, in things like this, like the back pain stuff as well. It's just, it's just very hard to find them, unfortunately. Yeah, there's 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 just no way <laughs> that humans on the whole seem to be able to take out their own biases. You know, one individual yeah. ex- or not even biases, like their anecdotes. But it makes sense because of course that's gonna that's gonna paint your picture, right? I, I mean, I think this even explains you could say like politically, um, and, and you know, people who have these experiences with people of certain groups or whatever it is, it's like, you know, you could say, well this is wrong, like you should treat everybody equally, but it's like, sure, but I can also understand if, if that's your personal experience, you're gonna have a strong bias despite what people might say. And same thing with, you know, different diets, right? So, well, I lost a ton of weight on this diet. And I mean, I can't tell you how many people I've tried to tell them, look, the reason is because of this and that and that, but they're just like, well, it worked for me, so that's it. And then they, of course, like all these carnivore people, right? Yeah. Well, you can say, well, there's no legitimate evidence for it and whatever, but hey, they saw results from it they feel better on it. So then they talk to a million other people who have those same experiences. They don't talk to the tons of people who have left the carnivore Facebook group or the people who had horrible cholesterol or whatever problems. They just talk to the people who worked for it, right? So um, yeah, yeah, the bias is strong for all of us, right? I'm sure I have examples of that, right? And um, yeah, I thought about this recently with the the lower volume thing I posted yesterday about yeah. um, Alberto Nunez being like a we we converted him over to like the low to moderate volume groups and and obviously I'm, I'm being <laughs> a little facetious there but you know if if I was a big high volume advocate I could find all the wor- evidence in the world for that and all and I could have people saying yep look at how much more I grew with higher volume and I tried this and you know it, like we all just it I I think our own anecdotes color our picture more even even in those of us who are highly educated and, and try to keep that bias out of there you know yeah yeah it's it's very it's very hard to back to backtrack from something you said as well like I, it's um like it's it, i like to bash on people who cannot let go of their biases but i experienced it even like in youtube comments like the other day i read a very long response to something that i said in a video i think i said something about like how it's very difficult to track any amount of weight gain that's less than a kilo like two pounds ish a month uh for anyone so like maybe even if you're a smaller person it's worth gaining more um and then someone like elaborated in a very long comment that like look look you can actually just go buy a caloric surplus if you know what you maintained on earlier and you have like log books from like going back for like to a long time and I was reading it and I was like, like began formulating a response to like argue back. And then I was like, but no, God damn it. I actually agree with this. <laughs> it, <laughs> yeah. it was very hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually. And, and the whole bias and carnivore topic will tie into um, the next one, which is to talk about Jordan Peterson and some of his stuff. So, um, mm. but let me just, just wrap up on the pain thing. So, uh, you know, one of the reasons that this makes this very difficult is there There are a lot of factors that can be at play that that re- ha- that result in results that necessarily that not cannot necessarily be contributed to the intervention. Right. And, and that's nothing new. Uh, but for people who don't know, there's a term regression to the mean. All that means is if you could imagine somebody's pain, which is a common reason they would see, let's say, a chiropractor, for example, or a physical therapist. Or, or even when people come in to see me, you know, they'll say, hey, you know, I've been having this jaw issue, whatever. And a lot of times I just say, look, let's just wait. It's been two days. Let's just see what happens, right? Because sure, I, I could give you some expensive treatment and I could say, you got to do this and do that. But yeah, and then it might work, right? But if you mm-hmm. can imagine half the people are going to just go back to normal anyway, this this is, again, another example. I mean, honestly, we could have a whole podcast on just bias here, but you could like, you could have all of these people who let's say I said, well, you got to buy this this night guard and I'm going to make this custom thing for you because you have jaw pain. 
and half of those people get better. Well, now I have all of these people saying, wow, you know, I had this bad pain and he, he got me this. And within a couple of days, I was better. It was amazing. Yeah. And now I have this thing for life. Right. I'm wearing this night guard for the rest of my life because it held my jaw pain. And it's like, look, just wait <laughs> and see what happens. And if you go to a chiropractor, it's there is so regression to the mean, just meaning that you will when you go to seek out treatment, you're usually at your worst. Well, it's very rare that you're just going to stay at your worst. So then you get the treatment and you might have just naturally gone back to that average or mean level of pain. Um, so that's a big factor. Placebo, of course, we've all heard of a million times is a huge factor and a real factor. And then, um, and, and then simply just having a conscious effort towards those things, right? Like we all know one of the reasons you hire a coach or you start this diet plan or whatever it is, is you end up holding yourself more accountable. So maybe you go to a chiropractor. Well, now hold on, I'm, I'm going to the chiropractor. So I got to focus on keeping my, my back straight. And that, not to say that that is actually evidence to show that posture is not necessarily correlated with, um, with eventual pain. Same thing regarding the MRI scans. There are people who have a lot of pain that cannot be identified with scans. And there are a lot of people who have scans where you'd think, holy crap, this person must have a lot of pain and they're totally asymptomatic, which makes it even more uh, difficult to really assess. So um, yeah. I'm just, so all that to say, there's, there's a lot of reasons that we can get results from something without that thing actually causing the results. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like, I mean, so I'm sure. <laughs> Actually, I, I know you have um, some physiotherapists that you're physiotherapists that you're close to. So I wonder how many conversations like this uh, you had. But it's 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 the same thing there, right? Like many times, someone will go to a physiotherapist, like I I have done so myself. And yeah, in maybe two weeks, I was better off, and maybe I did some of these corrective exercises. And it's like, well, they may have helped, may may have not helped. I, I don't know because, yeah, in two weeks I got better. But, I mean, that's what's supposed to happen anyway, kind of, right? Right, exactly, yeah. So, um, And, again, obviously I'm not saying that these people don't do anything. I mean, I, I think physical therapists are great. I'm just saying it, it can be tough and it's not as clear-cut as people think. Um, yeah. You know, I have a, another one I talked to. I mean, yeah, obviously a number of physical therapists I talked to, but one of them is <laughs> like, you know, we basically have a couple of these exercises to try and then hopefully it works. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's not as specific as one might think. So anyway, yeah. so so let's then touch into the uh, the bias thing, because that brings up Jordan Peterson. And um, I, unfortunately, I see a lot of people. So people who don't know, Jordan Peterson is a clinical psychologist who came onto the scene really big in, I want to say, like 2016, 17, around then. Um, and he, he was a professor at Harvard and uh, I think University of Toronto. And he's he's got huge following. And he's kind of been pigeonholed as helping men. Um, and, you know, people who are, I think, a little bit more on the liberal side really criticize him and, and say that he helps straight white men and, and whatnot. And then other people say that he helps a lot of people. And, and I know... Um, people from many different walks of life who are big fans of him. Uh, Abel, you and I have talked about him plenty of times. And I, and I think, mm -hmm. you know, without getting too much into one side or another, I do think that a lot of his content can be very helpful for people um, from a from a neuroscience and psychological standpoint. Um, but with that said, with people kind of finding things to criticize, I have, he has been an unfortunately good example of i i posted um on my instagram story about it stating ultra crepidarian which is basically a, a term for somebody who is criticizing or commenting on an area outside of their expertise um or, or another mm -hmm. term would be promiscuous expertise which is that oh. um people oftentimes see that somebody is an expert in one area so they're oh this person is smart and then therefore their opinions on this other area are valid um, we and, and we all do this, right? We all have our opinions on things that we really aren't that informed about. I think politics is probably the best example of this, right? Everybody's got a strong yeah. opinion on politics when they probably and, and like I, I'm not saying I I know a ton about politics either. Um, I try to stay in my lane when it comes to that, but just it's an area that gets people really <laughs> riled up. And and you know, again, going back to the bias. So, um, but with Jordan Peterson and and some other people. I think, Abel, and you probably can relate to this too, when we hear people talk about nutrition, 
that is an area where we can really kind of pinpoint, does this person know what they're talking about or not? Right. Yeah. Because we, we've been around it for so long. If somebody's talking to me about neuroscience, yeah, I have a general interest in it. I know about it. I have, I have a couple of friends who are highly in, into neurosurgery. Um, I, you know, if somebody's talking about politics, again, I'll have a general opinion, you know, on, on a lot of stuff. But if it comes to nutrition, I pretty much am going to know, okay, this person is really full of it or they're, they're evidence-based and they know what the, the data supports. Yeah. And, um, and then Jordan Peterson back on Joe Rogan was talking about carnivore diet and it really helped him. And, but, but to that point, he said back in, again, whenever that was 2018, 19, that he's not a nutritionist. He doesn't know that much about the field. It just seems to work for him. Mm-hmm. And, and I can totally appreciate that. You know, it does seem like a lot of people are helped by carnivore diet who have autoimmune issues his daughter, who had severe health issues, uh, was helped a lot by it. And I could even say during my month experiment with it, I felt great. I mean, I really did. Um, I just I just think the cholesterol levels were too deleterious and we just don't have enough data on it. Um, but with all that said, he is now really, again, going back to his bias with it, he is all about saying how, you know, the food pyramid recommendations were the reason for obesity, even though I actually saw Mike Israel tell commented on that saying, like, he's got a different perspective. And the reality is most people didn't follow the food pyramid. So that's definitely not the reason. Yeah. And, he, and Peterson was just going so strong on it. And his daughter, you know, obviously, a very strong bias with it full on about carnivore. And it, it's just a perfect example of somebody stepping out of their lane, and being hugely influenced by their personal experience because even if all of the exact data existed that exists today everything all the the tons of information out there but their one personal experience was oh i did the carnivore diet and it didn't really help me that much even if they had all of these dozens and thousands of people out there saying the same thing they would not be these big advocates but because of their one individual bias they're like wow this was this is the best thing so um it's a little unfortunate to see from somebody who is, is you know probably IQ of 150 plus, you know, and, you know, very uh, well spoken and and thinks things out to see him kind of going down that route. Yeah, yeah, it's, to be honest, I, I just don't, like, in, in his case, it's really weird, like, because why? Like, because, I mean, he does know, I mean, probably he could give you an entire lecture about this whole, like, intellectual overreach issue. Like he knows exactly what that is, so it's it's just weird to see him falling for it for one. And a second, I just don't understand why he would even try to go down that route. Like maybe because he he just feels so strongly about it because it has helped him so much. Because in the case of someone like Tim Ferriss, I can see why he's doing it. Because I mean, he even has a book on like four hour body, like nutrition hacks and whatever. Um, but yeah, it's, and and it's very scary actually, like to me recognizing that moment that like, uh aha, okay. Like this person is actually full of it because yeah, like when, like Tim Ferriss is a good example. Like he talks about a bunch of stuff and most of those things I don't know that much about. So, and he is a very good speaker, like he's charismatic and he can like, he's actually a champion of that, like looking into the camera with a straight face and saying something which like in some cases pretty dumb in the case of nutrition or just something very trivial like seriously he like shows up to a business conference and he sits down and he starts talking about like how he's boiling his tea in the morning and stuff like that and it's like man like the audacity to do this it's it's actually very impressive in a way but but anyway so like i'm listening to him and he sounds convincing to me in a bunch of stuff and then he starts talking about nutrition and I can hear it. It's the same tone. He's making the same faces. Like he's equally convincing, but I can hear that it's okay. Like he's just regurgitating something that he heard from, I don't know, for, from Gary Taubes or Mark Sisson or whoever. Right. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's a crazy, like the, the amount of inflammation I've seen from people who are consuming too <laughs> much sugar and whatever. And it's like a oh, dude, seriously, <laughs> at least be a bit more orig- original with all of this. Um, but and, and in that case, I realized that wow. So like 
how many other times was he full of it perhaps and i was just there mesmerized like how how amazingly smart he is so it's 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 very scary like like this makes you realize in some cases like how much stuff you're just accept like you're just taking at face value and like what percentage of those cases was someone actually just speaking some bullshit it's very frightening yeah yeah no that it's exactly that you know it's that realization of oh you know because i think and even jordan peterson talks about this you know he talks about that one of the i guess foundations of becoming a man is seeing the death of your father and i don't think that means necessarily literally but just that most of us if you had a, a good father figure you saw them as almost omniscient like they just knew things right and then as you get older you just realize i mean hopefully you maintain a good relationship like i have a great relationship with my dad but you realize oh they, they don't know everything or there's certain topics where i know more than them um and, and like they are flawed like all of us right and yeah. And, and I think in a way, there is still somewhat of that yearning for that figure, right? And mm. um, you you want to believe that this person, it can be a guiding source for life. And, and I think probably literally millions of people at this point have viewed Jordan Peterson as almost like a father figure. Uh, yeah. And I think... There are certainly worse options for father figures, right? Like, I, I really do think that the guy uh, means well and and uh, in most cases is trying to help a lot of people. And I think it's probably an overwhelming position to be in, right? Where you have quite literally millions of people following your every move and everything you say. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to fault this guy. Like, anybody who's in the spotlight like that is going to say some wrong things. Um, but it, it's it's tough because you you see that and you're like oh okay so i'm going to follow this advice i'm going to follow these guidelines and then he starts to go into these topics i know he's had some controversial opinions on climate change and that's an area where again like i don't have much of an opinion it's not something i'm well versed in but i know his opinion seems to go against what the, the standard uh opinion is and yeah. and again on this nutrition one that was an area where i was like oh like the, the climate change was more like huh i'm surprised to hear him say this it's different than what I've heard, but I, I don't know enough about it. Whereas the nutrition aspect, it was like, oh, yeah, I can tell this is nonsense, right? So, yeah. um, but, you know, again, I mean, we all do it. It's just it's just such a blatant example to go so hard on it. Um, and I, I hope that doesn't continue because probably for a lot of people, it, it's going to do something like it does to us, which is, oh, it kind of, I don't want to say it invalidates other stuff that he's done, but it makes you question a lot of it, you know? Yeah, it, it's, I mean, I don't know how much you have, a, how, how prone you are uh, to that, like looking for that internet father figure. Like I I certainly have been and I, I probably it's still there. It's just like at this point, I've been burned so many times that <laughs> I'm more skeptical. <laughs> yeah, but but it, it's, it's crazy to me and, and just seeing how much I'm not alone with that because it's very clear to see when you're, looking at what types of figures tend to get popular on the internet and all of them are like that like they have that vibe of the know it all type person and it's it's very it's very appealing to follow these people because i mean it would be interesting to just look look into what the psychological like underpinnings of it are but i'm, I'm guessing it would just simplify things for us because you have this one person who knows everything so you just go there for all the answers and that would make things very simple but it's um it's it's quite amazing to see how people are just like moths to the fly uh, to the to the fire or moths to, to the light right um they are just immediately these people blow up um like like nh <laughs> he's kind of living living in my head rent free as you can tell but um <laughs> But but it's uh, and and I talked to him about it when he was on my podcast that um, he talks a lot about like parasocial and like how fanboyism is so bad. Uh, but at the same time, like the way he comes across on his channel, like that caters to that because he has that vibe of like I know it all, like I have the answer for everything. Um, and yeah, like here and there, throwing it in that like I could be wrong or I'm not an expert on this, but but still having a very firm stance on things like that, that still caters to that fanboyism. So sure. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's, it's interesting to see like you can be more modest and, and you can 
actually act like someone who doesn't have all the answers. And that's great. That's what probably everyone should do. But those people will never get as popular, <laughs> typically. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, NH is, is a good example of that at no fault of his own. You know, I think it's just, again, he will talk. I, I don't I don't see all of his videos, but I know he had one, I think, on like dating and, and um, you know, how to talk with women, whatnot. And I think it's just, again, it's it's like, is that an area that you are an expert in or is it just what worked for you? And I mean, again, that's, again, I'm not trying to fault him. I'm just saying, if you look at his audience, it's probably a lot of, teenage to low twenties men, right? So that applies. Mike Israel does that. You know, I've seen him discuss a number of other topics from politics to porn addiction to, you know, a lot of things outside of his actual area of expertise, but it's like, oh, well, it's Dr. Mike, you know, he's, oh, he must have this valid opinion. Um, and, yeah. and to clarify, I'm not saying you can't have these opinions. It's just important for people to recognize that it's a discussion in that case, rather than, Hey, here's my expert topic of choice uh you know like you and i obviously we can have a podcast and we can talk about anything but people yeah. should try to vet out when that is an area that somebody really knows a lot about yeah yeah definitely yeah um so i going back to not back pain but back development <laughs> um you know we're uh -huh. all kind of doing a few different experiments recently you have uh, been doing a ton of volume for back and pretty much no volume for legs pretty much um <laughs> yeah. so you become full bro and yeah. brian uh thankfully finally is doing his left arm only experiment which i have done before um mm. and then i am actually experimenting a little bit with just uh i should say kind of whatever i want within reason um one day a week which in reality when you actually say it out loud like that it, it's like it, it's not much of a change um yeah. but so i don't know if you want to go first on yours obviously brian is not here to comment on his but i can at least tell about my left arm experiment later yeah so i have i remember like it was about a year ago like september 2021 when we talked about our training goals and I mentioned that I really want to focus on my lower back. And I also want to try to bring up my arms. And the arm stuff, I was like, at first, I wasn't super consistent with doing higher volumes. But I would say for the last, like, maybe four or five months, I've been, I've, I've been definitely training my arms with, like, considerably higher volumes than before. And I lowered the volume considerably on my chest. So I always like training my pecs, like it's one of my better body parts and the exercises were like, they always felt good. Like all the mind muscle connection stuff was there and I'm also pretty good at pressing. So it was gratifying to train it. And it was always like one of the first things on my mind when I was, when I went to a new gym, let's say it's like, okay, let's explore the machines. I immediately always went to their chest press machines and stuff. So it was like always a forethought. And now I've been really focusing on back and within that like lower back. So erector spiny growth was, was a pretty big priority. And I've been, I've been doing really high volumes for the past, like three, four months, like actually some pretty absurdly high volumes for my back. And honestly, the only thing that seems like it's sometimes tough to recover from is just the direct lower back stuff. So my lower back has been kind of sore uh, quite a bit, but the pulls, so yeah, all kinds of vertical and horizontal pulls. I mean, it seems like, it seems like I could do like a hundred sets per week and I still wouldn't be sore. Um, so it's almost like the reason I'm not doing even more volume is just simply like a time and boredom. Like I just couldn't spend even more time on these machines, but yeah, like, if I'm looking at my training lock from this past week, for example, and it, it hasn't even been that high um, compared to other weeks. But yeah, so horizontal pulls, I did 13 sets so far, and the week is not even over yet. <laughs> um, so narrow pulls, so I just call everything narrow pull that is like a vertical or close to vertical and the elbows come to the side so like a chin up or a close grip pull down or a one arm pull down um 
so 13 sets as well then so 26 sets so far uh erector so lower back 12 sets so so far that's 38 right and then i did wide pull so that's like wide grip pull down wide grip pull up i tend to niggle like that to be honest i did four sets only mm. so what is it 42 and then um so I, there is one called Erectors Plus Pool. So that would be something like an Arnold style row with a bit of hinging motion in it, you know. Um, that's only three sets. Oh, damn. I'm quite behind on this. So what is it? 45. And then lat isolation. So that would be something like a, a straight arm pull down, lat prayer, those sorts of things. Only two sets. So I'm behind on that as well. So this week it's um, 47 only. But like you've seen my log, like on other weeks, it could be like more like 60. Right, so, right. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because I, I think people imagine that there is, okay, so the more you can do while still recovering, the better. And the only problem is a recovery issue. And yeah. it's as if they see this chart where results go up and up and up, and then you hit this peak, and then it goes down and down and down if it's too much volume. And mm -hmm. in my experience, and I think a lot of people's experiences, the reality is you can still recover, just nothing else happens. And yeah. I have tried numerous times where I've done upwards of 30 sets, particularly for back, but also even for arms. And um, other than some temporary inflammation and whatnot, it doesn't change a lot. I mean, even uh, even Aaron Straker was saying how at one time he was doing five sets of calves, five sets a week, and they did grow, although... Um, small tangent here he did not take measurements which i always just i just find it fascinating people don't take measurements actually eric helms is doing a calf experiment soon with stretching and he did an ultrasound yeah. and i said did you take measurements and he wasn't planning to thankfully for some other reason he just took the measurements and i'm like you know i obviously ultrasound is going to be even more specific but I, I just don't understand why you wouldn't take a measurement it's such an easy thing to take and you know, it, it's what 99% of people have access to. So a little tangent there. But anyway, um, yeah. Aaron said that once he stopped, the results just went away immediately, which to me indicates, okay, that wasn't real growth then. You just had some inflammation and whatnot. So um, anyway, I have done 30 plus sets and I I recover fine. It's, it's not like I'm like, oh man, I'm so broken. I can't work out the next day. My body adapts to it, but that doesn't mean that it's better. And not to say that your experiment in particular is not going to work. I'm just saying that just a kind of a separate point that I think people view it incorrectly, that it's going to be like, up, oh, it's up and up and up. And then there's a perfect level of volume. And I think there's actually a wide range of volumes that could just be fine. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. No, I, I agree 100%. And and this is so so this is what people don't understand when i'm starting them on lower volumes if they are clients or why i would recommend starting with lower volumes and like in my case it, it was more so a case of just not like i just don't have anything to lose by trying this because i have been training for a long time and yeah like there are things that i would have changed about my back training going back but but not not too much to be honest like probably i would have done a bit more horizontal pulling i would have always done something for my lower back during those times when i didn't do heavy hinges but i was pretty consistent and pretty strong on a lot of pulling movements and clearly my back development was lagging behind like just i see random guys in the gym like haven't even been training for that long and they have better backs in some cases than i do and like on the front i destroy them so it's it's clearly a bit of a less gifted area for me. So I just had nothing to lose. But you know, for people that like they they have been training for like two years or something, they have like an okay physique, but like still more more kind of beginner ish looking. Like they have the inclination to do really high volumes and and they want to do it. But the thing is exactly what you said that you can do perhaps like 20 sets for every muscle group and you might do fine but you have like there is almost equally as much chance that you're actually just doing more than what's necessary and you're gaining equally fast you can do it as a like a just in case type policy but since you don't know and you 
kind of just have to hope that what you're doing is correct. Like, wouldn't you rather do an amount which is like less likely to get you into weird like recovery issues, like random overuse injuries that seem to pop up, pop up from nothing? Like the chances of all of that happening is a lot greater, basically the higher volumes you're doing. So that's why I typically like to just start people on a volume amount that I'm confident that it's going to be enough, but not so high that it can easily get you into these issues. So yeah, like, and, and that's the annoying thing about training, right? Like you're doing something and in that moment, like the moment you start doing a training program with the parameters that you have, you have no idea if it actually is working properly or not. And like you will just have to kind of wait patiently and three months from now, hopefully you will look up and something has improved. Then of course, like the strength gains you can monitor from session to session, but that, as you said, like, like that could be exactly the same on a wide range of volumes. So it's always just a bit of a guessing game. So, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And then I could see somebody saying, you know, well, wouldn't you want to be sure that you're doing enough? Um, and, and that's fine. And I think, you know, if you have the time and, and the inclination to do it, I don't think experimenting with higher volumes is a problem, but I just consistently, like, I don't think it's a coincidence that, you know, Alberto and a lot of these other guys do eventually come down back down to lower sets per week. Um, I remember even some people saying, oh, well, so you're only doing six to eight sets per week per body part. I guess this is just good. So you just, you're just maintaining now. You're not trying to gain anymore. It's like, well, <laughs> Uh, against my own wishes, I am mostly maintaining. Yes, <laughs> but <laughs> um, but uh, I'm still trying just as much. You know, my most successful cut ever was 2020, and uh, you know, I don't, who knows how much just not working had to do with that, right? You know, we obviously had a lot of time off there, but um, yeah. you know, I was doing six sets per week, and then back was 12, and that was it. Everything was six sets. Actually, legs might have even been a little bit less. Um, you know, like per, per body part there, but yeah. And, and I maintain pretty much everything. I mean, my, uh, strength is quite good. So, uh, but even, even for growing phases, I, you know, I don't, it's not like I double the volume because I'm, I'm gaining now. So, um, but I do like the idea of, of specialization seeing if, you know, once you're at a more advanced stage, just trying to emphasize that. So, um, Brian yeah. is now doing the, the left side only, he said he only started with about a quarter inch discrepancy between the two. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. I have done left arm only phases and it, it may be caught up temporarily. But then as soon as I went back again, it just makes me think, was it just a temporary inflammation? Because uh, they pretty much always had a half an inch difference. And the least they've ever been was a quarter inch. The most they've ever been was three quarters of an inch. But it, it's always generally about the same um, so I, I don't, I can't say I've had any evidence that any higher volume phases have done anything besides help my strength. My best pull-ups were from that. My best overhead press was from that. My best bench, they were all from specialization phases, but I, I can't say I have any evidence that from a hypertrophy standpoint, it, it's done much. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I think you have more of a right to say that because like you have developed pretty decently sized arms I, I guess from someone like me who has like always had like kind of like underwhelming arm size relative to other things uh well, actually maybe not relative to, but relative to other people <laughs> Let, let's just say that instead um it's maybe it's a little bit hypocritical to say that like well like i haven't seen benefits from higher volumes and it's like well but what have you seen benefits from <laughs> um but yeah so like if you if you have tried and, and have you tried like some higher volume, like arm specialization thing, for example? Yeah. I mean, most of the higher volume phases I did was, you know, back in the day, arm phases. And, uh, and again, they, they did help probably like a quarter of an inch, but then it just kind of went back to normal, you know, afterwards. So, yeah. um, and, and I would do it again just because why not, you know, it's just having fun with it, but it wasn't, I guess that could be one thing I could do to try to make things fun again. I mentioned the current experiment is that on, so I work out three days a week currently. Um, and one of those is a Tuesday workout and it just mentally was getting very draining because I was doing the same thing all the time. And for years, like literally the same exercise, the same execution from two to three years ago. So I decided I'm just going to do what I want. And, and what's funny is 
that's now been for, I want to say six workouts, maybe five. Two of them have been the same volume and actually arguably even harder because instead of like rest pause, I was doing three all out sets. So it took longer um, or even the same thing. Like my last one last Tuesday was three. Let's see. Yeah. Three rest pause sets each same exercises, just reverse order. So I think just the psychology of it was I was going in doing the same thing, hitting the same weight, same reps, or even if I was gaining a rep here and there, it was just very grueling. And something about it was just beating me up, I think, with other things going on in life right now. Uh, So just going in there and being able to say, I'm just going to do, quote unquote, what I want within a reasonable structure just made it so much more fun to me. I mean, this is why the same reason why I love working out on, on vacation, because I'm going in there. And I really enjoy the process. It's just, I think that's a new environment. It's new machines and stuff to try. So um, that has actually been really nice. Obviously, with it only being six weeks, I can't say anything good or bad has happened from it. Um, but the fact that I haven't noticed anything bad from it is is nice, right? It just means that I can kind yeah. of make that fun for me. Um, part of the reason was also I was working out in the evening on Tuesday. So, you know, I have this long day at work. I'm coming home exhausted and I'm sure some people can relate to this, but, and maybe you can, I don't know, Abel, but I'm definitely much more of a morning person. And Mm -hmm. there's just something different about the fatigue in the morning versus night. Like I could get five hours of sleep, but if I, if it's in the morning, I could, the term I've used since I was, uh, I don't know, a long time ago, it was called, I beat the fatigue by that. I mean, timing wise there's like there's a period of time before i really realize how tired i am right so there's that i just woke up kind of grogginess but i get up i have a shake and if i were to wait until noon on that day that i woke up at 5 a.m i'd be i'd be so sleepy right there's that sleepy drained fatigue where i just worked all day drained fatigue this is the last thing i want to do but at least for me that you know you just woke up it's just different and, and I, I will gladly work out during that morning time. So switching to the morning was a big difference. And then again, just, I think, getting to enjoy what I'm doing a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, I, I was trying to demonstrate, I, I was thinking of interrupting you and finishing the sentence for you, just, just to demonstrate again, my freakish memory. <laughs> <laughs> just cause I remember on one of our fa- uh, first podcasts, you saying that like, yeah, like sometimes, um, uh, you would not try to sleep until seven or whenever you would wake up, but you would wake up at four because you just couldn't keep sleeping. And then yes. you would beat the fatigue by going to the gym right then. Yeah. Yeah. But it's um, the, o- the only thing that's weird about morning workouts for me is like everything is just more rusty. Like it, it feels like if I have some small joint niggle or something, it is it, that it just feels worse. And, and I guess, so I'm, I'm sure you've heard all the data out there that like your workout performance is higher in the afternoon. And it, it does make sense that like you would be just generally more warmed up, like irrespective of like how your body temperature fluctuates over the course of the day or like it goes up and it hits a peak in the late afternoon maybe and then it goes down. Like not even that, but just, you know, just move around more during the day, even if you're fairly sedentary. So you would be kind of like more warmed up generally. So I definitely noticed that, that like I do need more warming up in the morning. So doing something like uh, like a heavy Romanian deadlift or something like that, that would I would be scared of doing that in the morning. Uh, I have done it. It's just always a little bit freaky for me. Um, but yeah, it's there's definitely something about like, just being emotionally and mentally drained it's just like even getting yourself to go to the gym. Like once you're there, it's kind of fine, but you, you just really don't feel like doing it many times. So yeah, I, I, I can definitely relate. But... Yeah. That, that it's interesting. The whole timing things I have my friend, Kevin, I've mentioned a few times. He always used to say how he got his best workouts later. He was clearly stronger, but now he's got kids and his body has adapted to working out in the morning. And, and there is evidence for that. And I've, I definitely feel that way because even I got used to later workouts at times. If I had to work out super early, it was a little bit worse, but um, your body will adapt. I do not think it's going to impair results at all. Um, And (laughs) I remember, uh, I don't know if you remember this, but Omar Esau had a video out. This is probably like five years ago now. And he was talking about how one of the reasons it was so much better to work out in the evening was because testosterone was highest. 
And I just remember being shocked by this. And I was like, this is a guy who's been in the industry for so long. And he's been around all these experts. And I heard, and I it, like, he seemed so confident in saying it. And I was just like, what are you talking about? It was just very odd. Um, Isn't it higher in the morning? Like, exactly. It's definitely higher in the morning. Yeah. That's yeah. why when you get tested, labs, oftentimes they won't even let you get tested after 10 a.m. because mm -hmm. you're trying to get it when it's, you know, highest production in the morning. So yeah, very strange that he said it. And it wasn't like a slip up either. It was like, it was a point that was made and then made again, you know, like he yeah. clearly was trying to say it was higher at night. So it was odd. Um, but in any case, I, I think it it's probably just whatever your preference is. But for me, I really hate it physically and I, I hate it mentally just all day knowing I've got to work out. So um, definitely I, I prefer in my ideal world, I, I get up, I have maybe a shake or something and I, I get a lift in around, you know, nine or ten. But given that obviously that doesn't work during the week when I'm working, I still much prefer, you know, six or seven a.m. versus six or seven p.m. Yeah, I mean, an another thing is that typically when most, so I'm, I'm guessing when you finish work, like what is it, like five, six, something like that. Uh, um, depends on the day. I mean, there's some days I don't get home until eight or nine. Yeah, but I mean, most people will hit the gym after five or six. So usually that's when the gyms are the most crowded. Um, actually, a random point on that. So I've been I started to use this other gym, um, like a, about a year ago, and I liked the gym a lot more at first than my old gym here. And so now I'm I'm bulking, like been bulking for like three months or so, and I mean I put on quite a bit. Like I'm, my face is nice and fat. Just in general, I'm nice and fat. And <laughs> I noticed that I just somehow don't really want to go to that new gym anymore. And I was like, but why is that? And then I realized that it's because that gym, like it's it, it turns out that like the fitness influencer type people of Macedonia, like they all go there. And it's like I realized that fuck, like going to that gym, it's it's almost like going to a nightclub or something like that. Like Everybody is on their phones, like uh, like taking selfies all the time. Like everybody is like dressed perfectly in the gym while working out, and everybody is eyeballing you. And it's like it's almost like this beauty pageant thing going there. And it's like, god damn it! Like it really sucks. Like I cannot even concentrate on my workout because it's it's just this constant like I don't know weird stress situation that you're in the whole time i cannot really put it into words but and i'm not proud of it like i know i should ignore other people and just focus on my workouts but yeah like be, being fatter as as much as i'm ashamed to say it i i just don't want to go to the gym anymore yeah <laughs> um it, it just reminded me that like because like usually i went there in the late afternoon i was like well if somehow i could arrange that i can go there at like noon or something when it's empty then i guess it could be fine but um, yeah, I used to, I mean, I've, I've mentioned this on the podcast before, I used to love the gym environment from probably college through basically all the time I was in university gym. Um, you know, I know I, I've mentioned this, but basically high school was fine. I mostly worked out in my basement in high school. I had a pretty decent setup down there. And then in college, it was great because everybody's about your age. Everybody's doing what you're doing. And you have similar goals, um you know similar paths in life and whatnot and then ever since then it just hasn't been great and then i i was working out at a retro for a while when i moved up here and i was starting to get those connections again and everything it was a little bit more fun and then they closed down so um at this point yeah I, I really don't enjoy the actual environment some of my patients are there which is fine i mean some of my patients are pretty chill but um it, it's more just the environment itself i don't love so i know i mentioned last time too that when i get you know, a different house, I will definitely be getting a nicer home gym there. That's top yeah. of my priority list at this point. And I and I think it's probably good. I was thinking about this the other day, actually, it's, it's good from a social standpoint, because it has been shown that people who are more social and extroverted, and have more connections, even some of these fleeting connections are happier on average. Um, but obviously, that doesn't replace meaningful connections. And most of the gym friendships, quote unquote, friendships and, and acquaintances, they are more superficial and transient, which I get all day, every day with my patients, right? So I get yeah. that same level of interaction there. So uh, I used to be hesitant about just losing the gym environment totally. But at this point, um, I don't know, I I'm less <laughs> concerned about that part. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, at, at this point, it would be a dream to have. That that is something like I love how NH talks about like why you should build a home gym, and he has these video titles like "Build a home gym, escape the gym Gestapo," like like <laughs> the things like that. Because yeah, like um, there are nice things about the gym environment and and the people there, and like the, the a little bit of chit chatting, a bit of small talk, like. I don't know, maybe maybe some like girl check you checks you out while you're lifting, like good for the ego, stuff like that. But mm. there's tons of things that are just making it such a drag at this point. So yeah, if I could just not not leave the house and just go over to another room and have a full gym experience, I mean that would be fantastic. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So all right, well, we're coming up on an hour here. This was a smorgasbord of topics, but actually, I actually thought it was pretty good. So we we got the yeah. uh, back health and chiropractors. We got the Jordan Peterson and promiscuous expertise. And then we got the whole <laughs> experimentation and gym culture. So solid yeah, podcast. Yeah. Pretty good. Any closing notes or thoughts? Um, not really, not really. Just um, yeah, I, I think I didn't plug my amazing Instagram account too much lately. So just for anybody to know, I'm I'm able fit stuff on Instagram. Just if anybody wondered. <laughs> Yeah, and check out his. Uh, was that the one where you had the uh, the trolling about entrepreneurs, or was yeah, that yeah. the other one? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that was the one. Yeah, oh my god, that was so funny. Yeah, so go to <laughs> go to his uh, account. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I, I did share that one, so hopefully it got some more views. Very funny for anybody who's ever been in like the self help entrepreneur book scene and all that stuff. So, on that note, closing out, and uh, of course, we'll link Abel's channel below. Thank you.